Uh, I need y'all's opinion on something. Uh, I just talked to Corey. He said this is an Alec Baldwin shirt, like from Beetlejuice. I, 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 know, you know, I, I know the movie, but I was like, dang it, man, it is. <sighs> well, it's still good to be in God's house with you this morning. Um, we're going to sing a new song. It's a song of celebration, of giving thanks. Let's stand. I just want to sing this chorus with you real quick so you can learn it. It's, it's one of my favorite new songs to sing. Sing this out. <clears throat> you pick me up, turn me around. You place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. Because you heal my heart and change my name forever. To the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. I try with all my might, I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Just when I ran I rode, I met a man I didn't know. He told me that I was not alone. He picked me up, he turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior. Got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends, burden and bitterness. You can't just keep it moving. No, you ain't welcome here. So now till I walk the streets of gold. Sun is found its way back home. Pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because He healed my heart, changed my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior. The celebration now. Hell lost another one. I am free. Oh, I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. Oh, yeah. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. Oh, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free.
Grave, you gotta get out this morning. Let's sing this out. Come on. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up out of that grave. Oh, get up out of that grave. So pick me up. Because he healed my heart He changed my name Forever free I'm not the same I thank the master I thank the savior I thank God Give my God a praise this morning. If you would turn your attention to the baptistry. Come on down. Uh, both Daryl and Kristen had made decisions when. Uh, when they were younger just had not been baptized um, and they told me that you know they hadn't been going to church anywhere and it's the coolest story because their daughter started asking them questions and they're like we don't know the answers to these questions let's get to church and so they came and visited Meadowdale um, and fell in love with it um, and we are just so excited to have them here um, and to have them getting baptized this morning and so Daryl, let me get you to grab your arm there. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to pray for you, um, and then we're going to baptize you, all right? Father God, I thank you so much for this man and his wife, Lord, for the love that they have for their child, that they want her to know you, and they want to have a relationship themselves with you. And Lord, I thank you that you tell us that if we call on your name, we will be saved, Lord. So, Father, I just pray that you would lift Daryl up and that you would just bless him, that you would guide his walk as he follows you, Lord. And just show him your mercy and your grace every single day. Lord, and help us as a church to help him to grow in his relationship with you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Daryl, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried to death in baptism and raised to walk in new life with him. All right. Now we've got his wife, Kristen. Now I'm really, I'm really proud of Kristen. She's a little nervous about being in front of y'all, so don't, don't, don't say anything weird, okay? All right, let me pray for you. Father God, thank you so much for Kristen, that she has made this decision to follow you, to give you priority in her life. Lord, we just ask that you guide her, that you show her the steps that she needs to take, both for herself, but also for her family, Lord. Let her just fall in love with you every single day. Lord, help us as a church to guide her and to show her the way as she pursues after you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried to death in baptism, and raised to walk in new life with him.
few in front of you, a blue card like the one that just fell to the floor up here. If you don't mind filling that out, Matt gave me a whole lot of stuff to do this morning. I got my hands full. Um, but if you don't mind filling that out, give us a little information about yourself. Um, we can answer questions for you that you might have, and you can put those in the offer plate, or you can turn them into the guest services desk out front, just to the right. And they've got a gift for you if you turn it in out there as well. Um, and those of you online joining us for the first time, Brian Anderson is your host this morning. And he's got some information that he'll put up online and he'll share a card just like the one that I have here um, that you can fill out as well online. Um, our mission here at Metadale is for everyone to know Jesus and grow in him. And you'll see that everything we do ties back to that one way or the other. It doesn't matter if it's our Sunday morning groups, our Wednesday night groups, our service in here, the things we do like the mission projects, fundraisers, everything we do is tied to that one mission of everybody to know Jesus and grow in him. You'll, you'll see that real quick here if you haven't already seen it. A couple of announcements this morning. The Malawi Mission Group has been uh, raising money through a t-shirt fundraiser, and this is the last week to get yours on order. There will be someone out in the foyer after the service to take your order for those t-shirts, um, but don't you don't want to miss that chance this week. Also, Jerry Cook, uh, the missionary that we've done some work with in Africa that some of you know and have talked to and seen before, will be here on Sunday, April the 7th at 6 p.m. to share with us that night. It's a little different because we don't normally have Sunday evening things, so go ahead and mark your calendar. That'll be Sunday, April the 7th at 6 p.m. Miss Jerry Ka I might have said Jerry Couch because I know a Jerry Couch, but Jerry Cook, Jerry Cook will be here that night. Um, Easter next weekend. Man, we got a, a good packed schedule next weekend. Starting Friday night, our Good Friday service will be in here at 6 p.m., March the 29th. The egg hunt, Saturday um, the 30th from 1 to 3. Weather's looking great right now. Should be an awesome event, so you want to come out to that and bring friends. Easter morning, got a lot. Sunrise service at 7 a.m. If you've never been to a sunrise service, there's just something special about a sunrise service. You don't want to miss that next Sunday morning. Um, breakfast at 8. You don't want to miss that either. Breakfast is always good around here. Our, our uh, team over there that cooks and prepares food for us does such a wonderful job. And then the Easter service itself will be at 1045 next Sunday morning. Notice I didn't mention groups. We won't have our regular scheduled groups next Sunday morning. Um, so we'll, we'll come in here at 1045. So if you show up early for groups, uh, there, we won't have those. So you can come to the sunrise service, eat breakfast, then go home, hang out for a little while, and then come back at 1045 um, for our Easter service. Um, out in the foyer, there are some cards with next weekend's schedule on them. They've got the egg hunt, uh, Easter service, everything on there. Those are great, not only for you as a reminder of what's going on next weekend, but remember we've been challenged. Who is our one? Who is it that God has laid upon our hearts to bring to church? Someone that needs to know the Lord, someone that maybe is out of church, whatever the case might be. Who's your one? These cards are a great way to invite those folks and hand them. So there's plenty out in the foyer. Um, you can pick those up on your way out this morning. Um, announcement wise, I believe that's the last announcement. So if those who are going to help take up the offering would come down this morning. As far as the offering goes, you can give, obviously, in these baskets as we pass those around. You can give online or we've got uh, giving stations in the foyer. And then also, uh, it's that time of year when we focus on our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Um, that helps support North American missions. So if you want to give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, those envelopes are in the giving stations out front. You can get one of those, put your uh, offering in there, and drop it in the station out front, or bring it back next week and put it in the basket if you'd like to do that. Um, but that's the time of year when we focus on that offering as well. If you will, join me as we pray over the offering this morning. God, we come to you this morning, Lord, with such thankful hearts, God, for what you're doing here at this church, God, to see families, Lord, getting baptized, uh, rededicating their lives to you and raising their children here at Metadale. God, we just thank you for what you're doing. Lord, we pray for this offering this morning. God, that what we take, uh, we will be good stewards of it. And God, we do pray also, especially for our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Lord, for the North American mission work that gets done. Lord, we know that it uh, depends on this offering. And so we just pray that you will bless that offering as well, God. 
and that it will go to further your kingdom, Lord, and further not only the mission we have here for everyone to know Jesus and grow in him, but God, for those throughout our nation as well who don't know your son as their savior. Lord, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Would you stand back up with us? Let's just keep worshiping our King. the 
eyes are on you, Jesus. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. It is well with you. It's because of you, because of who you are, because of what you do, that it is well with us this morning. God, we give you all the glory in this place. God, we thank you. We just, we hope that this worship has been pleasing to you. God, just bless this time as we dig into your word. God, just bless Brian. And God, just, just continue to be working in our hearts. I just thank you for this time in your presence and just continue to be here with us. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. You know, if you could imagine in the quiet of space, looking down on the little marble that is the earth 2,000 years ago, Right now, if you zoomed in slowly towards the Middle East and you'd see the Mediterranean, you might imagine, and keep going in further and tighter, and as you got closer to Israel, you'd start seeing the outline of Jerusalem, small but now getting bigger. And then as you, you paused and hovered above that city, what you would see this week, 2,000 years ago, would be a, a, a buzz of activity. Caravans of people coming up towards Jerusalem from these lower areas, moving people, celebrating people, playing instruments. You would see vendors all around. You would see the, the streets packed with people. Uh, and what it was, this celebration that had been going on for hundreds of years in Israel was at its height, moving towards the crescendo, which was Passover. And this day, as Christians, we call Palm Sunday. That's what we're celebrating today. But on that day, 2,000 years ago, what you were seeing were people coming to Jerusalem. They weren't coming for Palm Sunday. They were coming for what would be the Passover. And so as people moved in, this place got more and more dense. The Roman authorities who ran Jerusalem at that time would assign extra garrisons of people to police. So you had soldiers policing the area because if there was a religious fervor on top of the celebration that would be going on. And you can just imagine as you get closer, and maybe even go down towards street level, kids running, people celebrating, these different people from all over that area and actually from all over the region, as far away as, as Greece and, and Rome would be coming, all the Jews would be arriving if they could, especially the wealthy would arrive to celebrate the Passover. And so as this happened, this, this intensity, this intense celebration would also be mixed with this fervor that could be aggressive at times. And the reason for that is they were under occupation. They were being ruled by the Romans. They didn't like that. They wanted God to be in authority. They wanted the religious leaders to be the ones that told them what to do and not some foreign government way away. And so all of this is mixed into this stew, and it's in the midst of that moment that Jesus comes down from the, from the eastern side, and, and he rides in on a donkey. And when he does this, to us it seems like, eh, what does that mean? What does it matter that he did that? What does it mean that he came into town that way? Jesus with his rabble of followers coming into town. Well, it meant a whole lot. 
And when you understand the context of what was going on at that time and also the prophetic understanding that the Jews of that time had, there's powerful symbolism there. And so as we move into that scene, I want to read to you just one of the passages. There's plenty. One of the passages that's talking about that very moment in time. John chapter 12 begins, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees. They went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And so this is the, this fervor that Jesus rides into with people celebrating, and it's the palm fronds that we see uh, even now that we'll celebrate with. And all across the world, even today, we begin what we call Holy Week. This is the beginning of Holy Week. Not only for us, but Catholics, Orthodox, all around the world, Christians begin celebrating the Holy Week this day. And Jesus initiated that by riding into town on this donkey to people proclaiming him to be king which is an amazing scene, I can imagine, especially given the fact that there were thousands of people doing this. But the curious thing is, what they were saying wasn't really the case. If you think about what was going on, other religious leaders were there. They were watching this happen. They understood the political tension that was in the air because the Romans were watching just as well. What did they see? If you were a religious leader at the time and Jesus is riding in with his rabble of followers behind, what you saw was a self-proclaimed rabbi, untrained, uneducated, from a town that had never been and would never produce a prophet, Nazareth, and you saw him coming into town with this dirty following of people, this, this, this literal group of people that just trailing behind him you had heard some things he had done probably some kind of magic trick he had gotten quite a following going and now you've got to deal with this guy because not only is he coming into town causing issues on this week of all the weeks i have to process this i have to deal with this i'm worried about the romans seeing this and not only that the worst case is they're proclaiming him to be king in front of roman authorities who have caesar as the only king and now we've got an issue because not only that, but my entire life as a religious leader, I had been trained to lead Israel. And my position, my status, my authority was completely being questioned by this rabble rouser riding into town with everyone proclaiming him to be king. What do I do? If I was a religious leader, we know what, he, what they did. They went up and said, listen, you hear what they're saying? Tell them to stop. This is blasphemy. There's no king over Israel but God alone, and we certainly don't need you stirring them up this time of the year. But what did Jesus say? He said, I tell you what, I'm using my paraphrase, if they don't say it, the rocks will cry out. He didn't stop them. He didn't encourage them. He rode on. So what is it we're seeing? Something that isn't true, but is somehow. And so the thing is, if you think about this, it is completely wrong to say that Jesus is king at this moment. And when we talk about a triumphal entry, it seems backwards, because he wasn't a king. He's just some guy from up north that's riding in on a donkey with people that are following a small group, and they're saying he's king. Because I know that in less than a week, Many of the people that are in the crowd shouting, Hosanna, he's the king, would call for him to be crucified. In less than a week, those same religious leaders would see him murdered on the cross. In less than a week, we know what was going to happen. And so something's wrong with the scene when we say Jesus is king. I think we can get a little bit of insight because Paul, when he's in Romans chapter 4, verses 17, he says... Something that's very curious, and it's one of the few places in the Bible that we see this, but it gives us insight into how God speaks. Because we know that Satan, for instance, when he speaks lies, he's speaking in his native language. It's not that God speaks truth, he is truth. But when God speaks, he does it in a curious way. And we can find ourselves speaking as God, the way God does, in the same manner as God, if we think about Romans chapter 4, verse 17, where it says, God, who gives life to the dead, God calls those things which do not exist as though they did. He calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now, this is exactly what's going on as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, because he's not really the king 
but yet he is. There's a faith element. It's the same thing, just to give you an idea, this very sanctuary that you're sitting in was because somebody years ago called something that was not as if it was. They understood what would come to pass in this sanctuary in the years to come. We're only just at the very beginning of it now, I believe. And so they called something that was not as if it was faith. They were proclaiming what would be even though you couldn't see it. If you were looking at it from the religious leader perspective, that's not true. But they knew it was. And I believe there's a significant number in the crowd that did think Jesus was the king even though he wasn't clearly of anything on earth. He was king in their heart already because they believe. And so they're proclaiming what would be even though it's not now. Do you know that we can still do that? We can still speak as God. And so when I stand up here and I tell you what I think is going to happen in this church, I know I might look crazy. I may not be speaking about something you might believe necessarily, but I think it can be because if God says it, it will be. And when God says he's wanting to bless his people when they follow his will, when they acquiesce to his power, when they acknowledge what he can do in this community, I believe he can see, we could see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this place and it be overflowing. And the children's program busting out of the walls and us adding on to this place and Gordon County and the surrounding communities being saved in mass. I believe that can happen and you may not be seeing it today. But I believe that we can speak those things, and if God is willing, they can happen. It's the same thing that's going on. They were proclaiming what was, but was not yet. And there's power in what's going on there. Now, one of the things that happens here is they might have looked wrong in the moment. They might have even looked kind of foolish. These religious leaders were watching people, and they're like, look at these idiots. I mean, they had studied Scripture. They understood everything about Scripture, they thought. They were the guides and leaders and teachers of Israel. And you have this crowd proclaiming this man as king. They have no idea what they're talking about. You look like a fool. Did you know that God expects us to look like fools occasionally? And then that would lead to the question, are you willing to be a fool for Christ? I don't like looking foolish. I don't like being made fun of. But I understand something when I read 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. Are you willing to look like a fool so that somebody can be saved? Are you willing to take abuse? Are you willing to not be the most popular one at school? Are you willing to maybe not get the promotion? Are you willing to do what it takes to proclaim the message of the gospel in some way, either by act or by mouth? Don't just say it, walk it. Are you willing to look like a fool for Jesus? Because if you're not, you are not exhibiting the power of God for those that are dying. And let me tell you this. Not only should you be willing to do that, not only should you be willing to put a microphone on and have you broadcast to the entire world on the Internet, but you need to understand that you have no power outside of this in your life. Your education, your mental, your abilities to do things, your physical abilities, none of that is going to help you. It doesn't matter about your family background. It doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter who you're married to because you have no power in this world outside of this. Listen, the message of the cross forward is the power of God you have no power to affect eternity outside of this message why is it that Billy Graham understood it's a simple message why is it that he saw hundreds of thousands saved it's a simple message why is it that Stephen Pearson Gary Tate and other powerhouses of missionaries went on the field and they had a simple message it's the message of the cross it's all we've got You can fake it. You can act like your retirement's going to be there. You can say that you've done something in your career. Nothing will give you power into eternity outside of this message. And yet we try everything else. The people that were in Jerusalem that day were proclaiming something that was not but would be, and they were willing to look like fools to do it because they understood something had happened in their hearts already. So if we're talking about a king, and we're saying Jesus is king, and that he is and he isn't, which it is a weird situation when he's walking into Jerusalem, riding into Jerusalem on the donkey, it's a curious situation. But if he is a king, and we're sitting here saying at Metadale this morning he is a king, 
Well, he's got to have a kingdom. Or we've got to talk about kingdom. In fact, the idea, the concept of kingdom came up repeatedly as Jesus would move through his ministry. If you go back through all the Gospels and you look, it came up repeatedly over and over and over again. The religious leaders would bring it up. Even Pontius Pilate at his trial would say, what are you king of? Are you king of Israel? And Jesus would say, my kingdom is not of this world. And he would start teaching about the kingdom because people are saying, if you're a king, what are you a king of? And so one of the things that he told us is in Luke chapter 17, 20 through 21. And the, the religious leaders had pressed him on this matter. And so he gives us a little insight. He says, now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, when, he, they said, he answered and said to them, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. So it's not something you see. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, this is weird, right? Okay, so you're saying he's a king that isn't but will be, but is, and also now he's a king of a kingdom that is within people. Well, that makes it kind of hard to define, but I can understand that because when we, it says when we're saved that God comes and lives and makes his abode, to use the old word, he makes his home with us in our hearts. So I can kind of understand that, but it starts making it hard to see that as like a political ideal or even a religious concept. So you're saying that his kingdom, we're talking about the kingdom of God which should span the entire universe of creation. You're saying it's inside of us, and that's true. So it makes it a little hard to define, so let's go further. If that's true, then we know now, how do we see it? I mean, I can walk up to a border and see where the United States... Have y'all ever driven, and when you're going across the state line, I don't know what this is, maybe my family were weirdos. Well, I know they were. But we would lift our feet in the car when we'd go across... Some of y'all are, are from weird families. We would lift our feet when we'd go over the line in Alabama, and then we'd say bad things about Alabama. It's just what we did. But you knew when you went across a border because the road would change, there'd be a sign, there'd be a welcome to wherever. And if you go across a national border, there might even be a wall or a gate. So how do you see it? I don't know how to see other boundaries. How do I see the boundary of the kingdom of God? If it's within somebody, that's weird. Right? Is it because of what church they attend? I don't think so. And why is it that we don't see it more? I think one of the problems, the most important problem probably, is the perspective of the viewer changes what you're able to see. It makes sense because if there's a beautiful mountain and you're standing behind a tree, the mountain may be huge and all-encompassing nearly, but yet you can't see it because there's a tree in front of you. In the same way, listen to what Jesus says about this. He's speaking to someone and he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, this is John 3, 3, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, by the way, before we leave this, being born again is not some Southern Baptist redneck phrase that we came up with to throw at people that are Catholic. That's not what it means, right? It's actually in the Bible. And guess who said those, that word used, that phrase? Jesus. Jesus said you have to be born again to see the kingdom of God. The reason we don't see more of it, the reason people aren't talking about it is because so many are unsaved. We've already seen the numbers when Pastor Drew was with us. He had researched that. We know Matt's talked about it since then. What an incredible number of people in Gordon County aren't saved. So they can't see the kingdom of God because they're not saved. Jesus says, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But at the same time, the kingdom of God can be hidden, cloaked, as it were, not only because of the disposition or the viewpoint of the, the one viewing, but it also can be because of the people that are in the kingdom. We can prevent people from seeing the kingdom of God. And you're like, well, how is that? Would you ever want to be a person that's keeping others from seeing the kingdom of God and understanding that Jesus is the king, the triumphant king? Well, of course you would not. So how does that work? Well, that leads us to the next point. Remember I said when you go across the state line, you're aware of that. How do you know when you're approaching the boundary of the kingdom of God? Even now while we're talking, how do you know when you're standing in a parking lot at Walmart and you've seen somebody you hadn't seen in a while and you're talking, how do you know? Are you in the kingdom of God then? What about when you're at home and you're watching YouTube or you've got your feet up and you're relaxing after work? What about when you're at work? What about when you're at the ball field with your kids and they're playing soccer maybe? Are you in the kingdom of God then? Is it defined by political boundaries? It's like saying America? I don't think so, but there is a boundary line to the kingdom of God. Jesus gives us that as well. 
You cross the boundary of, your, of the kingdom of God when you act according to his will. In fact, that's one of the best definitions. The kingdom of God is anywhere that the will of God is acted on or enacted. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21. There's a lot in this, but we're only going to unpack a little. Not everyone, this is Jesus speaking, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, first of all, that's scary, because what this says is that people that claim to be Christian actually are calling Jesus Lord are not in the kingdom according to the words of Jesus himself. That's scary, but he says it's all based on your location from the kingdom of God perspective, it is based on you acting on his will. Obedience. So how do you walk into the kingdom of God? How do you step into the boundary of the kingdom of God? By acting on his will. You do the will of God in your life. And when you do that, this is the most amazing thing. When we talk about the kingdom of God, it's not a set boundary like a river or the edge of an ocean or some political line that's drawn on the ground. It's not like a flag you cross. It's not a wall or a fence that's separating you. It's simply you doing what God tells you to do. That's it. Now, here all this is where it gets really good because the kingdom of God being defined as such means it's dynamic. It means it can be expanded. It means that if the kingdom of God ends right here in my life because that's as far as I'm willing to go to meet his will, to do what God's asked me to do, all of a sudden I hear a redneck preaching a sermon or I listen to a song and I decide, you know what, I'm going to do what God asked me to do finally in this area of my life. And you take a step. Do you know what you've done? According to this definition, you have expanded the kingdom of God further into this world. You have pressed the boundary of God's kingdom further into this world. Think about the power I'm talking about. You didn't have to call an army. You didn't have to call up the National Guard. You didn't have to get fighters to go and bomb somebody. You literally just did what God asked you to do, and now you've pushed the boundary of the kingdom of God further into this world. And you say, well, that was nice. That's all it took. Can I do it again? Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Take another step for God. You're pushing the boundary even further. What if an entire group of people are just 12? What if just 12 people decided, we're going to do what God tells us. I'm going to push the boundary out here. Guess what? It starts expanding. It starts expanding. And do you know that even right now, you can push the boundary of the kingdom of God into your house? You can push it into your workplace. You can push it into your schools. You can push it into the ball fields where you're sitting. All you've got to do to push the boundary of the kingdom of God forward and expand his kingdom is just do what he tells you. Just do what he tells you. It's a simple concept, but it's amazing. And you say, well, it's in me. It is. It stays within you. But now you're pushing his will further out. What if we all did that here at Metadale? What if we all got the vision that we can expand the kingdom of God into Gordon County by simply doing what he's called us to do? That's what he's talking about. And that's what was happening as he rode into Jerusalem. Because I'm going to tell you, if you want to talk about the kingdom of God being in him and him doing the will of God, he did it perfectly with all power and all submission. And it just emanated from him. But it still took him doing it obediently. He proved that to us. He showed us that. And so imagine as he come in, he did bring the kingdom of God. And when he was talking to people, he's like, the kingdom of God has come upon you. It sure had because it's Jesus standing there. But you can do it too. You don't have to wait for a preacher. You don't have to wait for somebody to show you how to do it. Jesus, if, he's, if you're saved, he's living there. The Holy Spirit's inside of you. Do what he told you to. It's amazing. And now the king, the king who you give credit to, who you give glory and honor to, is honored, is respected because you're doing what he told you to. It's not just in word. It's in act. It's in the things you choose to do. Now... We understand now that the kingdom is it's got a king who is and is not, but will be. We understand that the kingdom is not as easy to define, but kind of easy to understand when you think about it. All we got to do is be obedient, and you move it forward. Well, now we called him something else at the beginning of this, the triumphant king. In fact, all across the world today, that's probably what most of the sermon messages are about. He's entering in triumph, and what does that mean? Well, triumph is kind of an old word, but it's the Romans would use it. And so just imagine Roman Caesars or Roman generals, and they would conquer another area or take over another nation or country. And once they did, they would get the leaders. They would humiliate them in some way, you know, put their eyes out, whatever, chain them up. And they would bring them to Rome, 
and they would get behind in this long, what we would call a parade, but there's no convertible Mustangs there for you to ride in, no prom queens, right? But you have this parade, and these generals or the leaders would have the other leaders that they'd conquered being pulled behind them, along with whatever weird animal they found in the area, and they would call this a triumph. That's what they did. It's, it's victory. In the moment, it's glorifying. It's exaltation for what has happened to expand the kingdom, literally. So when we say that Jesus was triumphant when he entered into Jerusalem, we're not exactly right. Because if you think about less than a week later, that sure doesn't look like triumph. Not to me. Can you imagine a man hanging on the cross, publicly beaten, humiliated, bullied, illegally tried, found guilty for no good reason, everybody knowing he's innocent but it didn't matter, being put on mock trial over and over, as many as six times possibly, depending on how you read it, and then publicly executed after he's been humiliated in, in the most painful, gruesome way that they knew how to do and they were good at it, the Romans, and you call that triumph? Is that what he's walking into? You're telling me that's my triumphant king. And you preach me a sermon like that, and I think you're crazy. And it's because I have ill-defined triumph. I've taken the Roman ideal of triumph. I've taken what the world has taught me. I've taken what the college taught me. I've taken what my carpet mill taught me. I've taken what my workplace and the people online have taught me that I've got to get ahead myself, I've got to do it myself, and I've got to earn my way, and I've got to make my way and take what I need. And that is what we see as triumph. We just scale it up. But that's not what was going on with Jesus because he wasn't triumphant when he rode into Jerusalem. He was brave because he knew what was coming. But our definition of triumph needs to be redefined. And he gives it to us. Colossians 2.13 tells us, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He is taking it away, taking it away nailing it to a cross. Think about what I just said. Every filthy thing you've done, everything you've done that was wrong, every ill-conceived idea, every relationship you broke, every person you hurt from the time you were a child until now, everything dark that you have ever done in your life, he nailed it to the cross. And not only those things, but he nailed the condemnation you deserve. He nailed it to the cross. Think about what I'm saying. He didn't just allow himself to be nailed. He picked up the sin of your life, and not just your life, but every person that lived before and every person that lived sin. And he walked into Satan's home ground. He walked into his home court in the darkness, in the battlefield, alone. Not a single person was with him. And he decided, he knew what it was going to take. He set his face like flint. He bled blood. He sweated blood because it was so stressful, but he still did it anyway. So when he walked into Jerusalem, when he rode on that donkey into Jerusalem, he knew what was coming. And he took it on his back anyway. And he carried it to the cross, shouldering every bit of the darkness of mankind of all time on his back. And he nailed himself and that to the cross for you. And verse 15 says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. No, Jesus was not triumphant when he rode into Jerusalem. That was not what made him our triumphant king. What made him our triumphant king was knowing what was coming and doing it anyway was understanding the pain and the darkness that he was about to endure and doing it anyway. What made him the triumphant king was the fact that he died in our place, that he was buried in Joseph's tomb, and that three days later he would walk out of that tomb on Resurrection Sunday. That's what makes him triumphant. It was the cross that made him my king. It was the cross that made him triumphant. And so we might say Jesus is no longer king of this nation, and that may be true. We might say Jesus is no longer and never was king of our systems, our financial systems, our stock market, and that may be true. We might say that Jesus is still not the king of the world yet. But that's not the question at hand. 
That's not the question that needs to be answered. The question that most desperately needs to be answered, the question that we need to know the answer for all eternity is not that. The question is, is he your king? Is he your king this morning? And you can tell me, I'm a Christian. I was saved when I was 12. I was saved when I was 20. I'm not asking you that. Because we've already seen you can be out of the kingdom and say you're saved. I'm asking you, is he the king of your life? Are you expanding the kingdom into your house, into your own private life, into your thought world that you live in and nobody else knows? Is he king there or are you? Because if Jesus isn't the king of your life, there's only one other that's sitting on the throne and it's you. Is it time for you to step back off that throne and let him be who he is? King, glorious, triumphant in your life? If you're not saved today, I can tell you right now, you think you're the king. You think you're the queen. But nobody else can do it the right way. And I could ask you in private and say, how's that going for you? How is it when you do it your way? How is it when you've tried it your way? When you're the boss, how's that working out? Maybe today you should re-ask the question, is he my king? And if you put yourself back 2,000 years ago on that road, standing with the palm, watching Jesus ride by as he is this morning again, which of the two are you? The one saying he's the king with your mouth or the one knowing it in your heart? I'm not asking just if you're saved. I'm asking if you are letting the kingdom expand in your life in a way that makes a difference. Proclaiming things that aren't as if they are. Seeing faith push the kingdom forward. Seeing what God can do in this church. I don't know what you need to pray for this morning. But if we're talking about Jesus being king, it's a serious question. Stand with me this morning. I'm going to pray for us and then I'm going to be down front praying for myself and praying for you. If you've got business with God, I'll be down front. You don't need me. You can pray in your seat. You can pray down front. But let's let him be king. He's earned it. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that even us, small us, here in this place can see the kingdom of God expand, Lord, just by doing what you ask us to do. Now, Lord, we don't have to get on a plane. We don't have to get with a microphone in front of millions of people. Lord, we can just do what you ask us to do, even in our homes, in our private lives, at work. And Lord, we know we don't always look gracious. We understand that we might even look foolish to some people. But Father, I pray you give us the strength and faith to understand how important it is that we let people know you're our king. You're not just the king, you're our king, Lord. Help us to push the things out of our lives that keep us from making you that. Help us to put you back where you belong in our lives, Lord, as king, on our throne, on our heart. Lord, help us to give it up. And if there's somebody here that doesn't know you as king, Lord, I pray this morning, right now, that they would find that out. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in this place. You've already shown us again and again. You baptized two more in this place. Lord, it is amazing. Keep doing what you're doing. We thank you so much for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
the king of my heart Be the wind beside my sails The anchor in the waves Oh, is my song Let the king of my heart Be the fire inside my veins The echo of my days Oh, is my song Let the king of my heart The King of my heart, be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, is my song. And you are good, you're good, oh, and you are good, you're good, oh. the baptism certificates and Bibles is as an official member of the pastor search committee I can't tell you much but I can tell you this you want to be here next week 
Trust me on that. If you can't be here, you need to be watching live stream. Don't want to give you any details because I can't. But you definitely want to be in attendance next week if you can. So that's officially as a pastor search committee member. I mean, not that, that, yeah, sure. Great job, Brian. <laughs> not that being here next Sunday wasn't already on your list because it's Easter, right? Um, I, I'm not sure if Brian and I are still friends after all the mean things he said about the place that I'm from. So, um, um, anyways, thank y'all so much for being here this morning. Um, one quick thing, or two quick things. Y'all can have a seat because it's going to just take just a second. Um, first, I want to um, announce and welcome um, our new family that got baptized this morning, Daryl and Kristen Brown. If y'all can stand up for just one second. Um, they are also joining as new members, and so we're excited to have them this morning. So be sure to say hello to them um, as you see them um, and just say welcome. Um, one other thing um, that I want to talk to you about is Easter next Sunday. I want to give you all a couple, um, we're calling them encouragements because we can't really make you do them, but if you do them, they would be really helpful for us. Um, the first is this, if you are someone who does not have children, we would really appreciate it if you would park in this big parking lot over here. Um, you know, next Sunday is Easter. There's going to be a lot of people here. Um, and we'd really love to be able to leave the smaller parking lot, which is closer to our MKids building, um, for both guests, but also families with children so that they can quickly get their kids to MKids and, and get over here. If you park over here, it's just as close, I'm telling you, to walk to the sanctuary over there as it is. So um, if you can help us out just for next Sunday after that, you can go back to your favorite parking spot because um, I know Brian Holland will. Um, you don't mess with his spot. The second thing, um, if you do have kids specifically, please try to be here by 10.30. There, there's going to be a lot of kids to check in, and that line could get really backed up, and we want to make sure that you're in here for the start of the service. Um, so that would just really help Regina and the MKids team out if you can be here a little bit earlier than you might normally um, because we want to make sure that all the families are able to get their kids checked in and get over here to the service by the time that we start um, also, just remember all the other stuff that we have for Easter, Good Friday service on Friday, the Easter egg hunt on Saturday, and our Easter services on Sunday. Invite that one. Let's pack this place out and have a wonderful Easter. You guys have a great week. You are dismissed.